Coming up on this week's travel show, I go way back in time here in Turkey. Wow. Yes. That is unbelievable. Also this week. The orchestra that's bringing a classical beat to the streets of London. We head to Spain to find out how to cook the perfect paella. Mm. And there's a device for your bike that's bound to get you noticed. Now we're starting off this week in Turkey. It's a country that's been in the news recently because of political events, but it also has a rich and important history stretching back over 10,000 years when it comes to the story of civilization. And this summer marks the culmination of an archaeological project there to unearth some of the secrets of our earliest ancestors. I went along to take a look. I've just arrived in Çatalhöyük, which is about 45 minutes drive outside of Konya, here in central Turkey. I'm going to meet up with Borja, and she's going to show me around. Hello, how are you? Good. I brought some weather. Yes, you did. <laughs> it's you brought raining wherever I go. So. So, Borja, tell me a little bit about the site here. This is a site that's about 9,000 years old. It was first settled at 7,400. BC and it was settled continuously for about 1200 years. About a thousand to two thousand years before Chitalik was established people had started domesticating crops and animals and this is a point in which we know that people prefer to live in communities in villages year-round rather than only hunting and gathering but we also know that hunting was an important part of their lives too. So it's not completely abolished by any means. They were quite wild. The significance of the site was only first properly recognized in the late 1950s. And in 1993, British professor Ian Hodder and his team of archaeologists were invited to spend the next 23 years excavating wow. here. Wow, that is unbelievable. I mean, the sheer size of it is just, kind of just takes your breath away almost. And there's a lot of work being done. These guys are still working here. Absolutely, but, yeah. I mean, from what I can see, that these houses are almost staggered. The sheer preservation that we get here on this site is unique. This is what we call in archaeological terms an agglomerated settlement, where people built their houses next to each other and in a sort of beehive fashion, mm. and they entered into their homes from their roofs. I mean, you can see it's a very sort of concentrated Absolutely. Um, kind of settlement, as you were Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. The preservation is amazing. You it can, is. You can definitely see the walls kind of mm -hmm. strutting up. Yeah, you can see the mud brick and the mortar, and you can see the plaster that was applied on top of the walls. And um, what's incredible about Chatoyuk, of course, is the fact that we get wall paintings. What's maybe most fascinating about this town is that life here seems to have been pretty egalitarian. So far, there's no evidence of any hierarchy in terms of buildings or spaces, and everyone's house seems to have been pretty much the same size. The archaeologists think that each home was lived in for around two or three generations. Then it was closed up and filled with soil so that a new house could be built on top. Watch your stuff. <laughs> it's dusty and slippery. And as the excavation project draws to an end, it's a race against the clock for the archaeologists to uncover as much as they possibly can whilst also preserving the site. Oh, yes. We have just uncovered this building and they're on the latest floors of this particular building. Ashley is our site conservator and she is uncovering a faint wall painting very slowly. Wow. She actually has a scalpel. A scalpel. <laughs> it's great for plastered walls. It took us about two weeks of work to get to this level where it is to remove all the infill 
which came up all the way to the top of these walls. Right. Um, and it was a very hard, concrete-like, clay-rich infill. Yeah. It was a lot of hard work. This is building 80. Wow. That is unreal. Now, this I haven't seen anywhere else on the site. And these are actual drawings mm -hmm. done all those years ago. Yes, yes. This building is dated to about um, 6,500 BC. And uh, that is a drawing that has actually, can you see the two different paints? One is more orangish and yeah, the other yeah, one is yeah. more red. And so would they be different pigments or done they at are different, different times? Pigments. There are different pigments, um, although both, both of them are ochre based. I think it's just mind blowing, just thinking about all those years ago, 8,000 years ago, somebody had the idea of actually putting pigment on their wall and, and painting something mm -hmm. for aesthetic purposes. Is that, is that right? We don't think it was for aesthetic purposes. There was no decoration. Everything had right. a symbolic uh, meaning, as well as a functional meaning behind it too. But um, this wall painting was probably built to commemorate a specific event, or it may have been almost like a protection for the house. There were three individuals buried in this platform and you can see the holes and yeah. they were actually all children essentially mm. and it may help their journey the next journey that they went into we really don't know although the dig has uncovered many intricate wall paintings the real quest has been to learn more about the people who lived here 8,000 years ago questions like what kind of language they spoke and what type of family structures they lived in remain frustratingly hard to answer but by studying our Neolithic ancestors in death, the team here at Chataluk hope to learn even more about their lives. So what can I do? Can I so give you, can, hand? you can, yes, brush around from the side. Around the you, can, you can, yeah, remove all that dirt from there. It's quite scary knowing that it's extremely delicate and uh, I haven't got the slightest of touches. So I have to be very careful. It is actually quite romantic and a little bit sad that this individual might have been the daughter of a son of someone who loved him or her very much. And so does that, does that sounds go like through they, sort of your, your head when you're. It does. It does. Every time we remove, every time we excavate someone, because it's a person in here, and therefore we try to do our best to respect these individuals. We try to record them as accurately as possible and in that way I hope that we as archaeologists allow them to speak to us a little bit. <laughs> This is a bittersweet summer for the team here, because although they've uncovered so much over the past 23 years, the project is now drawing to a close. The experts say that there is still a huge amount of the site left to uncover, but for the time being, this dig is preparing to pack up and reflect on the part they've played in unearthing a fascinating part of the human story. It's not just the artifacts that we discover or the houses that we discover, we that's important, but it's actually the way we practice archaeology has also been a good example for future generations. Next up, it's Global Gourmet, and this week we're heading to Spain to learn how to prepare the perfect paella. Bueno, hoy vamos a hacer una paella, una paella valenciana. La paella se desarrolla eh, en todo el Mediterráneo, desde, desde el Golfo de Rosas, en Cataluña, hasta, hasta Almería. Todo lo que es el litoral mediterráneo eh, se hace en paella, de diferentes formas, pero todos en común es la paella, que es el lugar donde se cocina el arroz. ¿no? La paella, eh, tenemos que tener primero los ingredientes bien definidos y vamos a hacer una paella mixta, una paella de, de, de pollo y pescado. Se pone, necesitamos para hacer esto pues, aceite, ajos, eh, tomate, pimiento, azafrán y un caldo de ave. ¿eh? Esos son los, los productos básicos. Después vamos a añadirle pues, mejillones, vamos a ponerle gambas, vamos cigalas. 
vamos a cocinarlo primero, se pone la paella a fuego, se calienta bien, se fondea todo lo que es el pollo con, con los ingredientes. Oh. El aroma es fantástico. Entonces, en sus orígenes es, viene de los, eh, de los campesinos, de la albufera, donde la, las eh, mujeres y los hombres que trabajaban el campo y el mar, pues no tenían más productos que el arroz, eh, algunas verduras de la huerta, caracoles, peces del litoral, y se lo ponían en, en, en la payera con el arroz, mojaban, metían azafrán, el ajo y el aceite de oliva. Esa es la base de la paella, ¿no? Ahora hay que probar de sal, el punto de sal es súper importante. Mm. A liter. Unos espárragos verdes que les va a dar sabor y color. Unas almejas, langostinos. Degustarla. Probamos un poquito por si le falta un poco más de cocción. Mm. Por favor, nos trae una botella de vino blanco afrutado para degustar la paella. Vamos a degustar a ver si está en su punto. Mm. Magnífica, magnífica. Still to come on this week's travel show. We're in London, saxophone in hand to join a street orchestra. This is really what music is about. The travel show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Welcome to the great outdoors. Soak up the view, have a little look around you, all around you. Oh no, you can't, can you? You can only face forward because what you need is a 360 degree camera. The Samsung Gear 360 allows you to record your unforgettable moments using the panoramic camera, and then you can view them from your smartphone. The camera is equipped with two dual lenses, each recording 180 degrees horizontally and vertically, creating a 360 degree view. The image quality that this captures is pretty much faultless. 30 megapixels on stills, plus you've got the panoramic images as well. It's really lovely. It syncs up with your Samsung and most smartphones really easily. It doesn't actually work with Apple phones, which isn't the end of the world. It's not waterproof either, but it will withstand a little bit of dust and some light rain. The beauty though in this does lie in the fact that it captures 360 degree memories, which in a place like this is ideal. I know, you know me as Mr. Outdoors, Mr. Rough and Rugged, right? Well, guess what? Even us tough guys need to relax. And believe it or not, inside this is my very own, well, sort of a bean bag, except it's not got any beans and it's not really a sofa because it hasn't got any cushions. Ah, you can call it what you like. It goes by the name of Lamzak. The Lamzak Hangout is a large bag that you can fill with about 600 litres of air. You can use it as a chair or lie vertically. It's made from ripstop abrasion-resistant nylon, and as you can see, it took a little while to get the air in there, but after a bit of effort, it worked. It's actually quite comfortable. It does the job. I was kind of a fan of this as an idea, and then I went off it when I realised that it didn't fully puff up to the size I thought it was going to. But now that I'm relaxed on it, and realising how portable it is, it's actually not bad. It's like being on a giant waterbed. If only there was a little cup holder there. That'd be nice. Come in. Yeah. Tough guys and tough girls need a tough watch. And the makers of this one claim it's one of the strongest in the world. No, 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 don't show, don't show my feet. There are lots of expensive watches out there, but the makers say it's one of the strongest in the world. It's definitely an action watch and doubles up as a compass. But there are some big claims here with its durability and strength. So there's only one way to test it out. I'm going to hang off it. Right, hanging off of this with all of my weight, the watch strap is completely intact where it attaches to the watch face. Where it did split was where the actual pin 
goes through the strap, but it's this bit that counts, and it's done the job. No, I am not my very own mobile disco, although with all these lights, it looks like I could well be. But every regular cyclist knows that being seen on the roads is a key part of staying alive. And whilst you can't put a price on your safety, this one does come with a serious cost. And in fact, also a matching backpack. The Lumo Harrington jacket is clever and sleek. And the Bermondsey backpack is made from waxed cotton canvas and a row of red LEDs at the front, which can be seen from almost 400 meters away. The LEDs are powered by a small battery hidden on the inside of the jacket, which you can remove and charge up via a USB port on your computer with a six to 14 hour battery life. Yeah, 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 I know it's not cheap, but in terms of safety wear, it's actually quite smart looking. It's nicely tailored and it feels good to wear, but most importantly, it will get you noticed. Just don't wear it paintballing, they'll spot you a mile off. And to end this week, each summer, London hosts the Proms, one of the world's greatest classical music festivals. When they were first introduced back in the late 19th century, their main aim was to introduce classical music to people who might have never enjoyed it before. This summer, a specially recruited orchestra took to the streets of London to perform a marathon of free music around the city. We sent Simon Platts, saxophone in hand, to join them. Nine o'clock on a Saturday morning in South London. Hi, I'm Simon. I'm, I'm going to play with you guys today. In the next 11 hours, we've got six concerts to play. The first tune is by Brixton boy David Bowie. I get off lightly, no saxophone part for me. And we're on our way before I've even found my feet. That was just the first of six concerts today, and this is the bus that will take the 40 volunteer musicians between them. What kind of people have, have signed up for this orchestra? Because they're playing for free, I take it. You know, they are, it's just yeah. for fun. They're all giving up a week of their life. Uh, they, uh, we had auditions a few months ago. Uh, we advertised and uh, amazing people turned up. I mean, the level is really, really high. It's amazing. Yeah. There's no hanging around. It's off the bus, set up, play. Then back on board. It's this pace that lets them play 25 gigs in just four days. The third stop is a garden party to help a campaign to stop these flats being demolished. Okay, we're about halfway through. Um, it's a really good mix of tunes. It's sort of a lot of classical stuff, a lot of jazz. It's, I think the audience is starting to really enjoy it as well. It's great. A conductor's pulled from the crowd at most gigs, and this time they get to conduct a solo from me. Okay, so we're heading to our fourth gig now of six. Uh, <laughs> this is a total guerrilla style, this one, so we haven't set it up with anyone. Uh, we're just going to turn up and play. They might kick us out, who knows? Let's see how it goes. Great to see. As soon as this orchestra starts playing, a huge crowd turns up. I can see why they do it. It really, you know, they absolutely love it.
So I mean, concerts that you do, it's you and uh, like uh, opposite the audience, and it's kind of like a barrier in between, and you don't interact. But with this, you get to interact so much and like get involved with the audience. It's tiring, but it's so much fun. Every time you get back on the bus, you crash, but then you set up and you start playing and you get energy again. Some people know the concerts are happening and come along, but most of the crowd are passing through and stop when they hear the music. You need to be able to dance to it in this band, don't you? <laughs> The last concert of the day is by a London landmark, the Cutty Sark, a sailing ship from the 19th century. So it's the final gig. What a place. What a way to end the day. At the end of this tour, most of the musicians will go back to teaching, studying and more conventional performances. Well, that's it for this week, but coming up on next week's Travel Show. I'm on the charismatic island of Cuba, famous for its classic cars and crumbling charms, but now entering a new era. As relations with the USA thaw, how will this feisty country with its natural beauty adapt to the inevitable rise in tourist numbers? That's next week, but remember you can check us out wherever we are or you are in the world by signing on to our social media feeds. But for me, Henry Golding and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Anatolia in Turkey, it's goodbye. <laughs>